Fantastic morning already gathered as a faith family. Hello and welcome. My name is Colin Terenzini. I'm the pastor here and we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us. Um, you're going to hear more a little bit about announcements and whatnot so we won't go into that but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father we come before you today and we just trust you. We trust you for uh, who you are as creator, as sustainer, as the one who gives life. We love you and we thank you that you have provided a way for us to worship you, and that is through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we gather here this morning as a faith family, I pray that you would encourage us, that you would convict us, that all of our singing, all of our praising, every moment in this worship service would be just that, worship unto a good and righteous God. Father, be with us today. We love you. We praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
As the choir comes down, take your hymn book and turn to page 43. This is my father's world. Stand with me as we sing. We'll sing all three verses. 43, 43. This is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees and skies and seas. His hand the wonders. On the second, <clears throat> this is my father's world. The birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white declare. about what you're singing on the third. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the Think about what you just sang. Let's read that third verse together. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. You know, sometimes we forget that God is really in control and that this is his world this is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. Um, when you came in this morning, um, you should have been given a, um, a bulletin. I want to go through that bulletin. We have a couple great things coming up. Um, first and foremost, though, you're going to see a connection card. If you, are our, if you are a guest here today, let me just say, and I cannot express this enough to each and every one of you, uh, you are our honored guest. Um, you had a choice to go to a lot of great churches around here, and you chose to come to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church, and I want you to know we don't take that lightly. If you would just fill that out and place it in the offering plate as it passes by, that way we have a record of your attendance and we can pray for you throughout the week. The next thing you're going to see is Christmas in July. Um, the Bethlehem Toy Store uh, held... Uh, the first Friday in December is for local families uh, who are experiencing financial difficulties during the Christmas season. Um, and so Christmas in July, we have a box down in the fellowship hall. Um, is that the only box, Miss Pat? There's one right over here in the information resource center. They're coming in slowly. All right, that's a, that's a, we call that a gentle nudge, a gentle nudge, uh, pick it up a little bit, and uh, Miss Pat brings those uh, to the associational office, and so Christmas in July, take part in that, what a great ministry. 
Mark your calendars as well. Chosen Road, it is a bluegrass band out of West Virginia. They are coming down uh, and they're going to worship with us on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. August 14th. They have quite a bit of a following around this area. And so uh, invite friends, invite co-workers, invite family. If you are a guest today, we invite you. We are going to celebrate the Lord and what he is doing. We are going to love on our community. Uh, Chosen Road, very, very, very good band. Uh, You can go and you can listen to them. Um, A couple other announcements real quick. Back to School Bash uh, is August 20th. August 20th. Um, and so it's just a few weeks away. Uh, we've always provided book bags and school supplies um, for all of the students that are in attendance. This is a way for us, no strings attached, to love our community. Um, plus, there's going to be an opportunity for everyone in attendance to dunk uh, the pastor. And so, uh, so there's going to be a dunk tank. There's going to be some bouncy houses. We're going to have some great food. Um, Um, But uh, if you could contribute, um, I don't know if we have a box yet set up. We do. It is down in the fellowship hall. Um, You can uh, donate, um, and we ask for uh, tons of things, Uh, book bags, pencils, papers, rulers, crayons, glue, spiral notebooks, uh, or composition books. Um, So if you would donate to that ministry, that would be absolutely wonderful. I'm looking to see, I guess there's no, uh, these flowers are beautiful. Are these, are these the flowers? The the flowers? Um, So um, a couple people within the church decided to go and and they gifted uh, Shaw's Creek Baptist Church with a beautiful set of flowers. However, while they were at the store, they had the people cut them down to size because they said, our pastor is vertically challenged. And so, uh, so I get in on uh, the other day, and uh, I don't want to say a name, Agnes, um, has, has a nice big bucket ready for me to step up on to preach this morning. So, uh, so I, uh, I love each and every one of you. Well, with that being said, why don't we go back and worship some more? So, Kathy, come on, and let's still celebrate the Lord. I think we need Savior like a shepherd lead us. (laughs) Page 61, let's stand. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us much. We need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us. brought us thine we are on the last early let us seek thy favor early let us do thy will blessed lord and only savior with thy love and beings filled blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, as we remain in a posture of worship, um, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. This is the time in our service where we give uh, to the local church and we give back to God. Um, We are a member-attended, supported church, which means it is by your faithfulness in giving that we are able to do some of the ministries that happen 
within here. So uh, let me say this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your faithfulness because God and Scripture sees this portion as an act of worship as well. Brother Joe, would you go ahead and pray? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James. We are going to be in James chapter 4, specifically looking at verses 13 through 17. Today we finish up chapter 4. We are uh, getting into the home stretch of our sermon series on the book of James called Faith and Works. We've seen some, some pretty bold statements from James. He, he calls us to be faithful during trials. He calls us to not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word as well. He calls us to, to look for the right wisdom that comes from above. He calls us to tame the tongue, to not start quarrels and fights. He calls us to judge in the right manner in motive. And understanding first and foremost that he is speaking to a group of people who are Christians. That is one of the things that I want to hammer in for everyone today, that if you don't know Jesus, that, this, uh, that, that James is speaking to people who know Jesus, who have been transformed by the gospel, people who are uh, new creations according to the Bible, people who are redeemed, people who've been bought again by the blood of Christ. They have the Holy Spirit residing in, and indwelling within them. And so he's calling for the Christian. And he's saying, Christian, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Now, James gives us insight as to how we are to plan. But not only how we are to plan, but really our total outlook on life. 
Let's read together James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Calvary. I pray today that while we see where the rubber meets the road and while we can take application away, I pray that we would make much of Jesus in the time we have this morning. I pray that uh, people that are listening, whether it be in this room or whether it be online, I pray that they would see the sweetness of the gospel that the gospel saves, that the gospel redeems, but also the gospel is the way we are to live our lives. If someone doesn't know that great and glorious gospel today, Father, I pray that you would convict them, that you would lead them, that you would draw them to yourself, and that you would save them. We love you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1859, associates of Edwin L. Drake responded to his suggestion to attempt drilling for oil. Drill for oil? You mean drill into the ground to try to find oil? You're crazy. In 1876, Western Union internal memo said, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Four years later, Henry Morton, president of the Stevens Institute of Technology, commented about Edison's light bulb. Everyone acquainted with the subject will recognize it as a conspicuous failure. Eighteen months prior to the Wright brothers' flight at Kitty Hawk, Canadian-American astronomer and mathematician Simon Newcomb predicted that flight by machines heavier than air is unpractical and insignificant, if not utterly impossible. The president of the Michigan Savings Bank in 1903 advised Henry Ford's lawyer not to invest in the Ford Motor Company. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. Charlie Chaplin played down the thought of cinema when he described it as little more than a fad. It's canned drama. What audiences really want is to see flesh and blood on stage. Thirty years later, movie producer Daryl Zanuck dismiss television by saying television won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Human beings are not the greatest at predicting the future. A question for us today, where do we place God when we plan and predict? How does the sweetness of the gospel guide our plans? Our plans typically are a lot cleaner than what reality is. In 2019, I can assume that everyone who was planning for the year 2020 did not see a global pandemic coming. A lot of times we do not plan for the surgeries, for the cancer, for the ailments along the way. A lot of times we don't plan for the bad that can come. A lot of times in our minds, what we like to see is something cleaner with a happy ending. You know what I think in my own mind? 
I've looked back to everything I've planned, and never in my life have I put myself in the bad situation. I'm, I'm the Cinderella story riding off in the sunset. I'm the one that, that takes charge. I'm the one that does this or that. It's not me that has to tap out, say time out, bow out. It's not me that has to say, I don't know. It's not me that walks through those valleys. It's those other people around me, right? Until it happens to me. Today, today the title of the message is, If the Lord Wills. If the Lord wills. Let's look at two different types or two different ways of planning. The first kind of way is self-centered planning. James is speaking of merchants who at least some are Christians, but acted as though they were atheists. What does self-centered planning look like? They believe that they lord over their days. Friends, that is not the case. Their frame of mind does not include the Lord into their plans and allows us as readers to conclude that they are prideful. Which makes sense because the whole book of James really talks about humility versus pride. They are prideful in their planning. Worldly living doesn't always show itself in the form of rebellion against God. A lot of times... Worldly living just means we don't include him in our plans. But this stems from the belief, even if it may be subconscious, because if I asked everyone in this room, I guarantee you I would not hear it one time. I would not hear the word, yes, Colin, I lord over my days. No one would say that. No one would say to me, Colin, I'm sovereign over my days. No. No, we wouldn't say that. But a lot of times when we don't invite God into our plans, that's what we're saying. Or another way to look at it is we plan without a gospel mindset. Not including God in our plans is inconsistent with the Christian worldview. The worldview that believes in a creator and a sustainer. The one that is involved in every intricate detail. A creator that gives his children a promise that if we draw near to him, he will in turn draw near to us. A God who would redeem us by becoming the very sacrifice that we need, by taking the penalty and the punishment, by going to that old rugged cross, and by uh, by his own power defeating death, hell, and the grave. Imagine that. Having no thought of who God is in our plans would align more with the atheist. The atheistic worldview believes that this is it, that we are all material, that it's only matter. And so we should plan without God and plan in a way that places us at the center. We should eat, drink, and be merry. And whatever we feel comfortable with that brings us pleasure, that we should go after because at the end of the day, what does it matter? Proverbs 16.3 Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. They're not only planful in their uh, pl- they're not only prideful in their planning, but they're also prideful in their productivity. What James is not doing here, taking a time out for a minute, he is not denouncing people who plan. He's not. It it is okay for you to carry a planner. It is okay for you to go to Staples or Office Depot and buy a planner. I have a calendar up. We plan. That's what we do. But James denounces them when they don't invite God in on their planning. They don't invite the Lord in on their productivity. Deuteronomy 8.17 Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, 
that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. While a Christ follower would never say it out loud, we certainly are saying it within our hearts. My power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. The power of of me has gotten me everything that I have. In Matthew 19, we see the story of the rich young ruler who asks what he must do to gain heaven. The answer leaves him walking away Sorrowful. Jesus tells him to sell his possessions to give to, the poor and, uh, to, to give to the poor and to follow him. The reason why he is leaving sad is because the rich young ruler believes that he, with the might of his own hand, has made that money. We know that it has to come from the providential hand of the Lord. Whatever you have within this life, I look around and I don't know what your story is or I don't know if you've been successful in different areas as far as businesses and and, and you're prosperous. I don't know all of that, but I can tell you that all of your success has come from God. That He is the one that allowed you to gain the wealth, the knowledge, the resources, whatever it is, to get to the point and place where you are today. That is him. James is writing to a group of believers that are scattered due to persecution. They are living to some degree alone, not in community with with Christians, and in doing so, they are faced with different trials and temptations. They are faced with falling into hypocrisy and quarrels, slanderous speech, faithlessness, considering affliction, and also how they are planning their days, weeks, months, and years. Not just how they're planning, though, but really their entire worldview. This goes a little bit deeper than just what I'm doing next week, right? This is how we are setting up where God is in our life. Because here's the thing, if we are planning in a way that doesn't allow God into our life, then what else are we doing? Our whole worldview is compartmentalizing and we're putting God in a box over here because he's our Sunday task and not our Monday through Saturday task. Because we go to work and we have our own friends, but those don't mix in with our church friends. And then we have our church friends on Sundays and Wednesdays. And we're living this life that is uh, compartmental, and we're not seeing the whole world through the eyes of the gospel. That there are people out there that have never heard the gospel that will stand before a righteous judge, and if they don't know Jesus as the sacrificial lamb, friends, there's no hope. But today, as we are here in this church with a world that is wasting away, I can say that we have the hope of the gospel, and it is Jesus Christ. Uh, What does that do for us? How does that change Not just our planning, but our whole worldview. Christ-centered planning. The second kind of planning that we find is Christ-centered planning. Proverbs 19.21 Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 16.9 In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. I want to see what James talks about here. Christ-centered planning acknowledges the brevity of life. Folks, I've been here four months, and I've done three funerals already. I've done three funerals already. I can tell you that I've experienced just in the past four months the brevity of life. And a lot of the people and a lot of the faces that I'm looking out here today sat in those funeral services. I sat with them as they teared, as they cried, as they mourned, as they grieved. I sat with them through those hard moments. And I can tell you 
That life is short, and that's exactly what James is saying here. James alludes to life being as a vapor, here and then gone. Friends, we are but sojourners passing through. We are pilgrims on a pilgrimage that don't know if tomorrow shall come. 1 Chronicles 29.15 For we are strangers but before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. And so I want to ask you a quick question and you don't need to answer this audibly but I'd like you to answer it within the, 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 the little voice inside of you. If you went to the doctors today and he were to tell you, hey, I, I, I hate to bring the bad news, but you have two weeks. Two weeks. You have a, a massive growth, you have cancer, you have something, and, and, and the lifespan for you is probably two weeks. How would that affect your living? How would that change your life? Because here's the reality. You and I don't know if we even have two weeks. We don't. We are not promised tomorrow. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. You can look on the news. You can see the plane crashes. I just saw one this past couple days where it was a single engine plane crash and all the people on it died. And I think to myself, when they got on that plane, when they loaded their bags, they thought they were going to land in a new destination and they were going to be able to walk free. When we get on I-26, so many times we get into backup traffic and possibly it's because of construction. One day, praise God, if, if, if something happens, I, I pray that we can drive down 26 without any construction, but we're not there, and so, uh, so whatever. But so many times we get into this backup traffic, and what it is, it's an accident up ahead. And we find out that there was uh, uh, no survivors, or someone died. When they got in their vehicle and cranked their engine and turned on their music, and they got their AC going, they thought that they were going somewhere and they would get out of that car and they would go shopping or they'd go to their friends or whatever it may be. The point I'm trying to establish here is you and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. But so many times we act as though we lord over our days. There's a country song, I, I like country music, and there's a song that it says, I'm never buying green bananas. And, uh, and I like that thought. I'm never buying green bananas because I don't know if I'm going to be able to experience that banana. <laughs> oh. That's the question, though. We aren't promised tomorrow. This very well could be our final day. How would that change the way you take your moments today. How would that change the way you establish your steps in the next two weeks? Would it change anything? Or would it change everything? Maybe you hear that from the doctor and maybe you walk out of there and you say, I'm living in a way that is not pleasing to God. I need to get right with the Lord before I meet Him face to face. Maybe you think to yourself, I've lived a life that I go to church and I know Jesus personally, but there's a lot of people that if I were to die at my funeral would be the very first time they heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Why didn't I tell them? Why did I have to wait for my pastor to? How would it affect your view of the gospel, of the world, of your obedience. I think the story, I think about the story of Noah and the ark. People thought he was crazy, that he was mental, 
They made fun of him. They scoffed and laughed at him for obeying the Lord. He is preparing for something that is, quote-unquote, unnatural, something you can't see coming, and they find it hysterical. That is a great depiction of the Christian life. We are obedient to the Lord in our plans. We plan for a heaven that cannot be seen. We are saving our treasures up for eternity, something that is out of this world. And they scoff and they laugh and they say we're delusional. However, just as the flood came rushing in, one day the bridegroom will rush in to collect his bride. If today is the last day, friends... Make a commitment with me. Let's burn the ships, as they would say. Let's make sure that we are living missionally in a way that makes much of this wonderful Jesus that is central to our life. Psalm 39.4, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Christ-centered planning aligns with the providence of God. James says, instead of doing it in this manner, by being prideful, by not even bringing the Lord into your statement, think of it as this, if the Lord wills. When we plan... Allow us to hold tightly to the Lord. Allow us to plan with Him and His commandments in mind. Allow us to understand the brevity of life and do what matters to the kingdom of God and not to the world. What matters to the world? Eat, drink, and be merry. Rack up your debt. Buy that house doesn't matter if you enter into a covenant relationship with a, with a wife. Those are the things that the world would say. But what is the kingdom? What does God of the kingdom tell us? To be wise. To not just make the gospel something that you're saved by, but make the gospel something that you live by, that you wake up and it is fuel, that it is air, that it is water, that it is your nutrients, that that's what you're seeing in every day. And you're going around and you're looking at people, not as their, with their problems, but you're looking at people as image bearers of a righteous God who loves them and wants them to have a relationship with him. How would that change our framework? Let's plan with the providence of God in mind. I was reminded this week that the gospel is not just a way to get into heaven, but it is a way of life. It is how we see everything that happens. Imagine living this way. Paul, on his missionary journey, is going to different places to speak to different people about the great and glorious gospel. They they may have already had plans to go to Asia. But what does Acts 16, 6 say? And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word, in Asia. Imagine that for just a moment. Paul is a missionary. He goes on three missionary journeys, um, which is not just me going to Brevard. It is thousands of miles by uh, animal and by foot. He's going through dangerous territories, and he's not in a free country. He is in a closed country, a country that's going to run him out, a country that is going to potentially stone him, a country that is going to arrest him, and he's going to these places because he realizes that something is more important than his life and that is them knowing this great and glorious gospel. And so he's going, and he's excited. I'm going to share good news with the people of Asia. And the silence in his head and his heart. No, you're not. No, you're not. I want you to go this way. And you know what we see? Obedience. Okay, Lord, I'll go that way. 
their plans become secondary to obeying the Lord's plans. Christ-centered planning starts with, if the Lord wills. My question to each of you today, what if the Lord says no? What if in your planning, even something you really want, the Lord says no? Are you okay to accept that? Are you okay to accept that? James says back in the first chapter, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Friends, in the garden, the Lord provided Eve to Adam. In the garden, after Adam and Eve sinned, it was God who provided the garments of skin. In the wilderness, it was the Lord who provided manna from heaven and a water from a rock. When Israel had nowhere else to run and, and the Egyptian army was catching up, it was the Lord that provided a dry ground in the middle of the sea that they ran through. It was the Lord who provided tablets for Moses. It was the Lord who provided the ram caught in the thicket for Abraham. It was the Lord that provided Elizabeth with a baby late in her years, friends. It was the Lord who provided himself as a sacrifice. It was the Lord that provided the Holy Spirit to you and to me. If the Lord wills, it will be done. The ending of chapter 4 is by James saying that essentially lazy Christianity is sinful. Why? Because we know what to do and yet we don't do it. This is called the sin of omission. So I want us to understand that there's the sin of commission when we, knowing what is wrong, go and disobey and do that. We're doing something that is wrong. And then there's the sin of omission. We know what is right, and yet we don't do it. And so there's two different types, and this is what James is alluding to right now. He's saying, you are Christians. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have heard about the great and glorious Jesus who would resurrect himself on the third day and offer eternal life to a rebellious people. That is the Christ that we follow. And yet, you plan as if you don't know him. You plan in your outlook of life as if there is no God. You know what to do, and yet you don't do it. A lot of times, and this is all of us, a lot of times we get caught up. We get caught up, so to speak, with our own, our own mindsets, our own wants, our own needs, we get caught up with the hustle and bustle of life. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. What I mean by that is you can be uh, young and you can be thinking of college and not planning for uh, a, a, in the way that the Lord would have you. Uh, you could be in your 20s and 30s and you could be thinking about a relationship that wouldn't be God-honoring. You could be thinking about something. You could be seasoned in life, having worked, and you want to live your retirement by living your best life in a way that you don't want to serve the church, you don't want to work in the church, you barely go to church, this is your time to relax and, and vacation and and. and, and all of a sudden, priorities get mixed up because you're not serving your local body, you're not telling people about Jesus, and you're, uh, uh, um, you know, I love John Piper, he has a sermon, and his illustration is he's collecting seashells. He said one year uh, he was doing something and he saw a magazine and he said, Diane and Ralph have planned for so long and, and now they're at the point where they get to go down to Florida to collect seashells. 
And he thought for a minute, he said, that is the worst thing in life. You're using your retirement, not for the glory of God, and you're going to show up at the judgment day, and you're going to say, God, look at my treasure. Look at my collection of seashells. He says, do not live this travesty. There was an illustration that I saw at one point. It's not my original, but I'd like to use it today. So the pastor said, this is your existence. This is your existence. And it just keeps going on and going on and going on, right? That you were born, that you were knitted within your mother's womb as as the Bible says, and that you will face a day where you'll stand uh, before the judge and there's two places you will go. One, if you understand who Jesus is, if you've understood the gospel, if, you've, uh, 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 if you are saved, then you will be with Jesus for all of eternity in a place called heaven. And if not... If you've, uh, if you've rebelled against Him, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've said no to Him, then you will be eternally separated from Jesus in a place called hell. So this is it. This is our existence. Can everyone see the little bit of tape here? I should have done it in a different color. There's a little bit of tape right here. That tape is our life on this earth. So all of a sudden, we see how long this is, but instead of planning for here, we're saying, this little notch right here, this is, I'm going to graduate. This little notch right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my first house. This is when I'm going to get married. This is when I'm going to have my 401k. This is where I'm going to retire. And this is what I'm going to do. And all of our planning consists of this little portion of this long, everlasting rope. And that is what James is speaking of in chapter 4. He's saying, stop planning right in here and start planning for all of this. But so many times we find ourselves in this little portion saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to gain this, I'm going to save this, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to go here, I'm going to live there, I'm going to retire here, I'm going to do all that. And we miss the most important part of this. Do I know Jesus? And will I live for Him? Friends, one decision, one decision that we make right here affects all of this. And so as Kevin comes and plays, my question to each and every one of you today is what is it going to be? What is it going to be? As we look at James chapter 4 and he talks about planning, our application goes a little bit deeper than that. And it's this, are we living such a life that would be gospel-centered? Are we living a life knowing that there are people that we come in contact on a daily basis with that may not know the Lord and Savior that you and I know? Are we going to live a life in a way that would be glorifying to Him, where we come in here and we worship and it's like sweet aroma to Him? Or are we coming in here, compartmentalizing, living a different life out there for the world, not telling people about Jesus, not being obe obedient to His commandments and to His Word, and all of a sudden we come in here and put on the greatest smile that we have and we praise God and we walk out of here with not knowing if our eternity is secure in Christ Jesus. Friends, here's the thing. My question to each and every one of you, where will you be in 3,000 years from now? Where will you be? Because the Bible, my Bible is clear. There are, are two places that you can be. 
That if you've said yes to Jesus, if you know the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Him, that you and I are dead in our trespasses and sin, and He knew that, and He was so gracious that He would send His only begotten Son to this world to live a perfect life and die on a cross for you and for me so that we can put our faith into Him. That His blood that was spilt on the cross of Calvary now covers your and my sin. If you understand the Gospel and you've repented of that, good. My Bible says that we will be in heaven for all of eternity worshiping the Lamb that was slain. But maybe, just maybe, someone here, maybe you've been here for 50 years, or maybe this is your very first Sunday here, and you find yourself at a place saying, I know of Jesus, I know about Him, but I have never made it personal. You will stand before a righteous judge, and He will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Don't allow that this morning. Don't allow that today. We aren't promised tomorrow. As I close, I'd like to tell one, one final story. Um, I had a mentor right after I got saved. It's my, uh, my brother's father-in-law, and he's a pastor in Gaffney, South Carolina. And, um, and he went on a trip, and I wish I could tell you what country it was. It was in South America. Uh, it was not Haiti, but it was something close to that. And he goes down there, and he's talking to two people, a young guy and an older guy. They're on a motorcycle. True story. They're on a motorcycle. And he's giving them the gospel, and this young, this young guy gets very emotional. He's weeping. He says, I need, I need your Jesus. And they say the sinner's prayer right there. And the older guy says, I, I'm not ready. To be honest with you, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not ready to do it. I, I'm older, but I still have a little bit of time in my life. My brother's father-in-law pleaded with him, come to Jesus, come to him. He kept saying no. Later that evening, they get a report that that motorcyclist with his passenger got hit by a tractor and both of them died. And so what do we know from Scripture today? That the young man who is crying out, pleading for Jesus Christ, is with him. And unfortunately, the one who said, I have more time, really didn't. Is that you today? With every head bowed and with every eye closed, you have an opportunity to make the greatest decision of your life. Or maybe you've already made it. Maybe you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that He is personal to you, that He walks and talks with you, and that maybe you've heard this and you've thought to yourself, well, you know what? I do find myself in the category of compartmentalizing my faith. That I don't plan according to what the Lord wants, what the Lord wills, what the Lord has. That I'm not living every day with the gospel central in my mind. This is a great time to commit that to the Lord. To repent and say, Lord, allow me to live every day gospel-centered, gospel-focused, and allow me to show people the preciousness of Jesus. Or maybe you've come here today and maybe you're like the older gentleman uh, in this foreign country that's on a motorcycle that doesn't know how long he has, but maybe you're saying, I have more time, Lord. If that is you, I'm glad you're here this morning because there is a good and gracious God that would send His Son to the cross for you and for me and that we can have everlasting life, that we can have a peace that surpasses all understanding, that we can have a joy that comes from the good news of the gospel. If you don't know Jesus in a personal relational way, I'm not going to embarrass you. Would you just slip your hand up in the air? 
If you don't know Him and you want to know Him today, you are not promised tomorrow. You're not promised next week. This is the greatest decision that you can make. Would you just slip your hand up in the air if that's you? Do you want to know Jesus this morning but haven't? Allow us to make a pact and a commitment together that our worldview would be gospel focused. Knowing that people are out there that don't know Jesus. Knowing that they are image bearers to God. And knowing that God has commanded us to make much of Him. Allow us to infiltrate our hobbies, our work, our families, every bit of our life with the beauty of the gospel. Allow us to be missionaries right here in Hendersonville. Father, you are amazing that you would send your son, that you would die for us, that you would allow us to meet together as a faith family to look in the book of James and see uh, how he would call Christians to live a life worthy unto God. And I pray right now for each and every one of these uh, members here, each one and every of, of these people here, and I just pray that you would, that you would begin to uh, magnify their relationship with you. That they would want to tell people about Jesus. Father, be with us. Allow us to be convicted and encouraged and molded into the likeness of your Son and allow us to go and leave here today with a heart that would be on fire for the gospel. We love you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The church is not the steeple, but the...